The Westboard Library and the Quick Center for the Arts is proud to present an official Apple podcast, Oh Brother, Not Another Podcast, with me, Makes Burroughs. And I'm Trace Burroughs. And today, uh, we're very happy to have on our show Marsha Mason, who's done so much so in her career, television, films, um, stage, extensive stage performances, lots of awards, uh, nominations. It just goes on and on and on. Um, and I'm ancient. Uh, I'm ancient. <laughs> yeah, on and I should, maybe I shouldn't have said on and on and on. <laughs> uh, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> but that's good. I mean, here you are, and you're still act, you're still doing stuff. Oh God, yeah. You're still involved, and yep. uh, so you know, so. you would have. Just, uh, yeah, I just watched a video that you did with People Magazine, and I noticed that piece of art that was in the your beautiful home. You're in Washington, oh, Connecticut. Yeah, thank you. You're in our we're art. Don't give her out. Don't give out her street address. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Although it's pretty obvious, I people in Washington are very keen on it because it's a modern contemporary house in a majority of uh, New England uh, traditional. Uh -huh. Like farmhouses yeah. and stuff. Yeah. Oh, it's beautiful. Thanks. So where do we begin, Meeks? <laughs> There's so much <laughs> stuff to get into. Um, so ra I'm going to go just randomly into different things that are. Uh, so reading up on you on different places, it says that you, you were a race car driver at one point. Did, yeah, yeah, that I did that. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> I, I raced for seven years, a little over seven years. You're on, you're on Paul Newman's team. Paul Newman was a fellow Westporter. We're in Westport. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. Uh, Paul was actually the one that got me kind of started. Um, uh, he he and I were just happened to be on a, a plane coming to um, L.A. from New York, um, and we were talking, and he was going out to Riverside to do, I guess, a last race out there, and I asked if I could go out because... I loved racing, and when I was in high school, uh, my best one of my best girlfriend's father had bought a track, and on Sundays, uh, we would go to a really early mass and then go out and ha hand out the pit passes for the uh, funny cars and the, everything. So, so I was always kind of keen on it, but um, I traveled with them whenever I could. And then Paul said to me one day, you know, why don't you go to a, a racing school? And I didn't even know they had them. Um, and so I did. And uh, the next thing I got a little car and then I hooked up with a, uh, a fellow um, uh, person that I had met at one of the schools I went to, Bondurant's and, you know, Skip Barber, uh, John Russell and all of that. And, um, we had a little mom and pop thing because I was uh, living out in L.A. And um, my Ho Willow Springs was uh, the two tracks that we had out there. And then I hooked up with Mike Lewis uh, out of San Diego. And um, he's a big championship driver. And he said to me, why don't we do an arrive and drive? And they fixed up a car for me. And so the next seven years, Mike and I went out and... I raced all the SCCA races and the Nasport races, and I had a GT3 car, and um, I went to the Valvoline runoffs, I think, four times, four wow. times in a row, yeah. Are, are, were you the only woman in that? Is other women drivers? At the beginning, I was, yeah, yeah. Um, especially in GT3. Uh, in stock car, of course, there are m many more women. Yeah. But in GT3, there was only one other woman, and she mostly drove uh, Mercedes cars for the Mercedes company uh, showing executives around and things like that. Um, but it was only the two of us out there. Right. Mm -hmm. You consider yourself an adrenaline junkie? I mean, beside the cup. <laughs> yeah. I must have been, right? <laughs> yeah. Wasn't that scary? <laughs> I just didn't have enough to do, I guess. <laughs> but I loved it. I had a great time. I Did met you have to... people. Yeah. 
did you have to wear a Nomex suit? Race car drivers? Oh, those? yeah. I had a, a balaclava the whole nine yards. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I had the seat, you know, formed to my body and yeah. everything. Yeah. Did you ever visit Paul out here in Westport? Did sure. Ever... Yeah. 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 It was lovely. Yeah. And I actually played the Westport Playhouse. I, oh, yeah, did... I was going to ask. Yeah. 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 I did a play by Somerset Mom called uh, The Circle. Uh, directed by Nikki Martin. Yeah. We were both, my brother and I were both apprentices there at different times, but we both oh, apprentices. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. You know, ushering, building sets, <coughs> it's the whole theater thing, you know. Oh, that's yeah. lovely. Yeah. So uh, one part um, in your life, I don't know if you're still doing it, so you, you've been to India many times. Yes, hmm? I went to India twice, actually. Yeah. Twice. For, yeah. And are, are you still a disciple of, let me see if I pronounce this right, Swami Mukhtananda? Muktananda. Oh, Muktananda. Mukta, yeah. I'll never yeah. get that right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, yes. Do you I still mean, follow his, his? Oh, yeah. And what is, it, what is his main message? Uh, Siddha Yoga is basically um, meditate on yourself, honor yourself, because the self of all exists within you as you. So that's the basic premise, um, using mantras or breathing techniques uh, and meditating. Yeah, and uh, I studied the Upanishads and Kashmir Shaivism and some Vedanta, uh, it, you know, his particular Siddha Yoga um, was, is based on those teachings. Mm -hmm. Uh, Indian scriptures, yeah. Do you, do you meditate? Do you take time every day to? Yep, to yep, that? yep. And also uh, walking meditation. Um, you know, um, uh, using uh, japa. You know, the beads and or a mantra while you're walking. Uh, it's a wonderful way. Uh, Thich Nhat Han uh, introduced. You know, walking meditation. The Vietnamese Buddhist, I believe. Um, all of those teachings basically are teaching the same thing, really. Uh, it, they're just different disciplines that you decide how, how best to get into that deepest, quietest part of you. Uh, I think Deepak Chopra has done a lot to uh, bring you know, meditation to the mainstream as well. Um, so there are many techniques you can use, uh, but I do think that meditation is uh, key to uh, a better life. We had interviewed Fran Drescher a month or two ago, and, and she, uh, she was so passionate about meditation. And of course, she dealt with a lot of traumas and tragedies in her life. And it was very, it was the most healing, you know, really saved her, I think. That's incredible, yeah. I, I do think, I mean, it's uh, for me, meeting uh, Swami Muktananda, it really sort of answered all the heavy sort of uh, philosophical questions that I had as a as a as an a young adult and um, and I found it liberating um, and um, and it's continued to stay with me all these years. I met him in nineteen seventy three so seventy four so uh, I started out with uh, TM, with Transcendental Meditation in, in the 70s. And even before that, I was reading uh, Christian Humphreys and some of the earlier uh, techniques that were introduced, you know, uh, as far as meditation. But at that time, it was kind of considered really woo-woo. Um, but, uh, so, you know, I've gone through, I've gone, seen it really become quite mainstream now and pretty, you know, part of a kind of average right. conversation. And you got to keep doing it, right? Not one minute, yeah. because, <laughs> because your mind is still always in, gets things, intrusive thoughts. That, yes, yes, uh, yeah. And the, the greatest part of it is just allowing those that that barrage of uh, mindless thoughts just <laughs> have to watch that. them as they just pass through without uh, trying to push them away or uh, push them down you know just let them float out and 
go back to, you know, a mantra or uh, your breathing even, just deep breathing and uh, eventually, you know, but it you do should take the time, take the time. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard for some people to do that. Like Yeah, me. but you can start out with 10 minutes. Right, yeah. You know? Yeah. So like Migs was saying, your your name is kind of embedded in our psyches, <laughs> uh, because and I, and I and I it's kind of like goodbye girl for me, you know. Yeah. For some reason, maybe that was a time that like there was so much publicity and but you've done so much other stuff, you know, performances are all all over the place. Um, and one of the things I was reading was that. After uh, you, first of all, so I'm going to get into uh, you got the you were married to Neil Simon, the great, uh, you know, playwright. Yeah. Also had movies, yeah. Screen, yeah. movies that yeah. he did. Yeah. And Goodbye Girl was one of those, right? One of yes. his. Yeah. yeah. And uh, but then you got divorced. Um, was that was that your decision, or was that like a mutual decision between you two? Well, I think. Um... It was ultimately a mutual decision, yes. Yeah. yeah. But we had, you know, 10 good years together, and we remained friends afterwards. Um, in fact, I went to London and did Prisoner of Second Avenue um, after we divorced. And um, I'm going to be doing Lost in Yonkers at Hartford Stage next year. So right. yeah. excited about that. I'm going to co-direct it with Rachel alderman and um and star in it um so i'm yeah. looking forward to that was directing kind of your, a new passion or a new direction or well i started directing in the 80s early 80s uh, around uh yeah 84 something like that 85 i directed an off-broadway show for second stage that was my first kind of professional experience as a director. I also directed uh, an afternoon school special back then and some local stuff that when I was still living in LA uh, in those in those years. And then I didn't do it for a long time. And then about six years ago, um, I got back into it and I've been mostly doing regional theater, uh, working at the Arizona Theater and um, the arena and places like that um yeah so and i really do enjoy uh directing and now i have several projects in the works hopefully they'll come to fruition uh in a year or so that i've been working on during the pandemic to direct and so we'll see what happens and and these productions your future productions that are you also part of the cat you decide on the casting who's going to be in it and all oh, that kind sure. of stuff. Oh, yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah, when you're the director, you, you get to do that. You get, you get to do all that stuff, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The ultimate revenge for all the times you've had to... <laughs> no, yeah. no, you don't do that. <laughs> hey, so, like, of all the... I, you probably don't have to audition anymore, I'm guessing. But, like, back in... You still you do? have to audition, yeah. You still have to audition for yeah. parts? yeah. So, so yeah, your whole life, yeah, like, what, you know, that all the executives and people in the networks and cable and everything, they, you know, they barely remember from <laughs> seven years ago, let alone 20 yeah. or 30. <laughs> I was talking to a guy, older guy, and he was saying he, he had a class and the kid in his class didn't know who Marilyn Monroe was. <laughs> exactly. No, I'm telling you. It's Which scary. is like mind blowing. <laughs> yeah. It is. It's a little scary, but there you go. Right. Are you prepared for the your fame? I wouldn't say you know it's never overnight. I mean, I, you know, people say, yeah, it was fame. You know, it was thirty. You know, it took me thirty years in a day. You know, it wasn't overnight. <laughs> uh, right, right. Um, were you prepared for the? Because you were, you became, you know, kind of the it movie yeah, star very of, the, of yeah, that time. Yeah. It was that that part was very true because. I did two movies back to back and they wound up being released in the same year and wound up with a Golden Globe and an Oscar nomination. And um, yeah, so that was, you know, that was a big uh, that was a big destiny kind of thing to happen. I didn't who who would know that that could actually take place. But, you know, what I think it was the years before 
and the training and the season at ACT and repertory that you know prepared me um, for those those roles. Um, but dealing with the success was uh, a little uh, overwhelming. Uh, I wasn't really ready for it, um, and it it was uh, it was overwhelming, quite honestly. Uh, mm -hmm. I didn't quite know how to deal with it, but fortunately I was married to Neil uh, around that same time, and that helped because he was extremely successful, and um, I could sort of hide behind that a little bit, um, and that helped me uh, get a, make the adjustment because he sort of took the attention, you know, uh, some of the attention away that uh, I was experiencing and wasn't really ready for. Um, it was, it was, it was, it was somewhat difficult dealing with it. And then, of course, uh, in those 10 years, we worked a lot and we had a lot of success together. And so when we no longer worked together um, and we got divorced, all of a sudden the world changed again and um, movies were changing in the sense that they were sort of focusing on young people a lot and so the work wasn't coming as much as it was before and I was sort of like a 12-cylinder engine, you know? I was used to uh, working a lot. Um, so. So all of a sudden, I, I realized that my identity as a person was kind of overly wrapped up in being an actor. And um, that was, you know, something that I had to work through also, that that was just my work and not my identity. And um, I made a big move um, to New Mexico and bought uh, some raw land and built a house. and. Uh, started a farm and created a whole business there and learned to be an entrepreneur and a business person and a manager of um, men and um, and run the farm yeah uh, and did that for almost 20 years well I continued to work but not as often you know as I would have and then after 20 some odd years, uh, you know, I w wanted to downsize and simplify and sort of come back east and refocus myself. And that's sort of, you know, part of the directing and um, the acting and everything. So, so that's, that was, that's sort of where I am today now. How did you pick the town that you're living in? Did you have friends that live up here? That you, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a lot of friends who live um, around here in New Milford and uh, New Preston and Canton, uh, Cornwall and Washington, and yeah. And so, and it's so beautiful here, and yet it's close to the city. And uh, I love the theater so much, and um, I've always considered myself a a New York actor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so so that's really and now I'm, you know, that's pretty much what I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah, pretty... I just did uh, I just was out in LA. I finished up uh, the final season of Grace and Frankie, so that was nice too. So how was that going back to the set after COVID? You had a big break yeah. with the COVID, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they did. But we were, I mean, I was tested five out of seven days and shields and masks and um, all of that. And, but it was still uh, made it wonderful. Um, and Jane feels very bittersweet. She's finishing up tomorrow for and then she's going on to movies and stuff. But it was you know. wonderful working with she and Lily and everybody there. It's just such a great group of people. And Marta Kaufman and everybody, just really wonderful. I went to Carnegie with her. Oh, you did, did you? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. I think she went to Carnegie, if that's the right yeah. one. She was like the Friends create part of partial yeah. um, executive director. Of anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, she Had was you uh, known um, Lily or Jane beforehand. I mean, were you friends or comfortable with each yeah, other? Yeah, I knew Jane. I knew both of them. You know, casually, uh, as you do in Los Angeles, we knew of each other. In fact, with Lily, 
she was supposed to do a film that Neil wrote called The Cheap Detective, and at the last minute, she couldn't do it, and uh, because of her commitment to her one-person show, um, and I stepped in and did that role. Uh. Uh, so, um, yeah, so I have a kind of loose connection to Lily also. And then, of course, we became, you know, more close and friends um, while we were working together on Grace and Frankie. Do you still teach? Yes, I have through the uh, Herbert Burgoff Studio, HB Studios. I still, mm. I, I taught during the pandemic, the first part of the pandemic. And uh, I've, you know, I did a, um, a master class for a week at Carnegie Mellon, uh, many, several years ago now. Uh, mm. uh, Gary Klein, who's the musical theater director there, um, got me there. And um, yeah, I like teaching. So what advice would you give to um, uh, actors that go to casting to relax? Because I, I dabbled like for a few months, even went to a few casting uh, sessions and I was like so petrified. It was hard to relax and, um, yeah. you know, be, I know like if you tense up, it's like you're, it's gone, you know. So how do, what would your advice be to an actor to how to relax um, in an audition? You ex uh, always accept the tension always accept oh. the nervousness, everybody. And you know, what was wonderful being a director uh, and being on the other side of the table or on the, you know, the other side of the camera, um, we're all nervous, you know, and we understand that. Uh, so it's okay. It's perfectly okay to be nervous. Everybody understands that's a given. Oh, uh, so know. don't, you know, again, sort of like meditation, don't try to push it away, accept, accept it. it, take deep breaths and do the very best you can. Yeah. And, uh, but the whole thing is, uh, for me, is show up uh, truly as yourself. Don't try to second guess what you think they want, because more often than not, I wound up uh, getting roles not because I, I was right for the role I auditioned, but they thought I was good even though I didn't get the role. I mean, that's actually how I got the first uh, two movies, the uh, Cinderella Liberty and uh, Bloom in Love, was uh, the directors recommended me to somebody else. So you never know. Yeah. This one part. Yeah, that's actually, advice I haven't heard before. Uh, mm -hmm. They, they go in, I've heard some actors say they go into auditions, well, beginning actors who turn out to, later to become stars, but say, you know, I, my first audition, I just said, you know what, I don't care if I get this. They go in with that attitude of I could care less, so then that relaxes them. Like, I don't care about this. I'm just going to do what I do, and they can take it yeah. or leave. You know, they do well, their best. True. Is that I, bad advice? <laughs> no, that's no. I think it's true. I mean, if you can talk yourself into believing that. <laughs> yeah. But I've been in that situation, too. When I auditioned for The Good Doctor and met Neil, um, I was already, you know, I, I was really planning on going back to ACT for a second season. So I didn't care. Uh, and then, in fact, during the audition, they said, would you read this other role? And they thought I had the sides to it. And for whatever reason, um, they weren't given to me. So I said, well, I'm happy to read it cold as long as you understand it's cold reading. And I just, you know, blew through it um, and thought, oh, well, maybe I'll get a call back. I don't know. And they actually hired me. So, you know, you never you never know. Yeah. <laughs> you Did you ever... Are there lines in any of Neil Simon's movies, plays that, that you improvised that he kept in? Or that does he ever confer with you and say, would you read this for me and tell me if that sounds right? Yeah, I, I read, uh, I, yes. Uh, he occasionally would do that um, and, and ask my opinion. Um, yeah. You'd want yeah. it to be in your voice, obviously. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I especially remember it with chapter two, of course, because it was about us, you know, uh, and he was writing the play at that time. I never did the play, but um, the big speech that the character has is something that 
came from life. Um, and I remember him giving me a, a scene to read early on, and I felt that the character uh, would, you know, be more angry at that moment, that kind of thing. Um, or sometimes, you know, he just wanted to watch me read it because uh, he said I had a very expressive face, and so he could tell right away if it was working or not just by watching me read some material. You know, he I didn't even have to read it out loud. <laughs> I just had to read it. But, uh, yeah, so it was fun. So was there any roles that uh, any of Neil's projects that, you know, I know he cast you in a lot of stuff. Was there any role that he didn't give you that you thought, hey, <laughs> why didn't I? Why don't you give that to me? I, I'd be good in that. No, no, I can't. <laughs> no, we, uh, you know, what we did was really great. It was yeah, really great. and I was very happy doing it. And we had a wonderful professional working relationship. We really respected and admired one another professionally as well as personally, and um, and we had a great working relationship, which. I talked to, you know, several people who've worked with their uh, spouses and sometimes it doesn't work, you know? Yeah. But fortunately for us, uh, we, we managed to make it work okay. In the people uh, interview with a tour of your home, which is again, spectacular, you said you love to entertain. So I'm just curious in a little capsule, what does a Marsha Mason party look like how many people oh, <laughs> oh the mostly i think the biggest uh, at least here that i've done uh, is 10 for dinner uh out in new mexico i had thanksgiving was a big one in new mexico so there'd be 15 16 people generally um and uh, otherwise you know a small you know four six eight people that kind of thing. Yeah, nothing to I the one time I gave a huge party and opened up the farm for uh, a charitable event. And we had we had two, I think, 165 people, but it was all outside um, and we served dinner and it was catered and all of that kind of thing. And I had yeah. help, you know, with it, but um, I've never done anything bigger than that. <laughs> Yeah. Play small dinner parties, play charades yeah. or, or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, right. do actor things, play charades. <laughs> no, we don't. We didn't. You know, uh, when Neil and I were married, we had a lot of fun doing some dinner parties, but the conversation was always really wonderful and scintillating. And yeah, um, yeah so mostly it was you, you, I like, I think the British are very good at that. They, they they understand that you know the meal is about socializing and contributing to the conversation, um, and so I find mixing people up it, it can be kind of a fun, wonderful way to do it. Um, yeah, that's that's good. It's funny you mentioned the British because in some interview he mentioned you were together, but they were talk, asking him about. Maybe it was in Britain, and and he and he said he didn't think the British got got him as well as America. That's true. It, yeah, the it, English. Yeah, he well because you know his especially his comedy. I don't think they did always. Um, although, I, part of the reason I think that Prisoner of Second Avenue was so successful is that it was Richard and I, and we understood him and the material uh but the it's it's kind of hard sometimes for the british to uh get his uh, got get his rhythms you know um on the other hand he thought that some of the plays that were adapted are uh, not adapted that were translated he was very very pleased with the italian translations and uh, thought those were really good, um, and he could always tell because of the laughter and everything, even if it was in a, and when we would go to Europe, invariably there'd be uh, some theater would be playing one of his plays. I remember we were in Amsterdam or Copenhagen, and somebody was doing Plaza Suite, and so we went and watched it for a little bit in a foreign language. In Dutch. 
was. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, so it was really pretty amazing. <laughs> Where can people see you? Uh, you know, we've been, you've been very generous with your time, so I don't want to take too much of it, more of it, but uh, where, where, where will you be? Uh, you're going to be in Hartford, is that what you said? You're gonna I'm going to be in Hartford um, in April um, doing Lost in Yonkers at the Hartford stage. So mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to that, yeah. When you do your project, these new projects, you yeah. pick like the play, like you, you, you search, you have a playwright write something new or you find some play and you say, oh, this is something I would like to get behind. Well, it's kind of interesting. The uh, two projects in particular, uh, I'm involved with the um, screenwriter and playwright, Tony Fingleton, who's Australian. He wrote a, a movie called Swimming Upstream with Jeffrey Rush and Judy Davis, an autobiographical movie. Of, about two uh, young boys uh, competing for the Australian Olympics and a dysfunctional family. And um, we are adapting it to the, to the stage. Uh, and it's kind of an exciting project. Um, we're hoping to have a workshop at the Alley Theater in Houston in the next year or so. And um, the big thing was to be able to show swimming without water. So um, it's very exciting what we're doing with it. And, uh, and then Tony and I are also, I did a movie for him called Drop Dead Fred, and that's a big- Oh, I remember that record. from way back, yeah. And especially in Australia. So we are writing the book for the musical right now. So oh. we're very excited about that and hope maybe in the next year or two, we'll have a workshop of that. So we'll see. Well, how do you swim? I'm just curious. You don't want to give it away, but are you suspended? <laughs> I don't, you'll have to come and see it. See, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Oh, you're show. welcome. You're welcome. My pleasure. It was so lovely talking to both of you. Thank you. Well, my pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.